Well, it's been... Um... And so, um, as a university, we have embarked on a project where we are refurbishing the old Senate building into a state-of-the-art archive precinct, which will hold all of these collections. And I think it's going to be um, an important place, not only for um, our researchers, but also for our students, undergraduate and postgraduate students, to be able in, to engage with the archives. Um, in one of our previous um, webinars, we had one of our students talk about um, the archives and how it actually provides rich information for us to conduct research. So today's webinar um, presents the findings of a process that we have gone through to come up with a white paper entitled UWC 2021 to 2025, Revitalizing Research Archives at UWC. I think this is something exciting, especially as we are, um, as a university, moving to effect digital transformation here across the campus. Um, this is clearly part of our new institutional operating plan, and we are excited to hear how our researchers can use the archives um, to, to use digital transformation um, as a way to, to conduct research. So we have some exciting speakers this afternoon. And I'm not going to talk about these speakers, but I'm going to leave that to Mattia to introduce. And I hope that you will stay for the duration of the session to hear what we have come up with. Welcome and thank you. Thanks, Jose. It's a, it's a pleasure to welcome our, <clears throat> our panel, our four people panel. Um, the, um, the first people I'd like to introduce is uh, our very own Professor Patricia Ace, who is our NRF Sarchi Chair in Visual History and Theory, based at the Center for Humanities Research at, at UWC. A researcher uh, spends uh, uh, the whole lot of African history, and she engages extensively with photographic archives and the methodological challenges that these present, bringing together history and aesthetics. The Patricia uh, uh, will uh, will give uh, a presentation. Uh, a double uh, two-person act, if I understand correctly, I mean, along with uh, the, uh, Dr. Valmont Lane, who is going to speak next. And uh, Valmont, uh, Sarah, could you please move to the next slide? Valmont, or Dr. Lane, is a next generation fellow also at the, uh, at the Center for Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, as a musician in the 90s, uh, Valmont developed a, a lifelong interest in critical thinking as the basis for activism, advocacy, and scholarship in the arts. He's worked uh, not only as a university arts administrator, curator, and cultural advocate, but he also played a leading role in uh, the development of collections and programs at the District 6 Museum, for which he served as an archivist and later as a director. And his research interests include music, sound studies, uh, archives, and heritage studies, and histories of technology. So Patricia and Valmont will give uh, um, uh, will give a, a joint presentation about uh, the white paper, which will be followed by a recorded intervention by uh, one of their uh, longtime collaborators from the U.S. Uh, Nancy McGovern, who is the Director of Digital Preservation at MIT Libraries and of the Digital Preservation Management uh, Workshops. She has been preserving digital content for more than 30 years, and uh, her interests include sustainable digital preservation and radical collaboration for inclusive communities. She is also the past president of the Society of American Archives and has got a PhD in digital preservation from UCL. So Nancy will give a, a recorded intervention about the uh, pitfalls uh, and uh, technology uh, issues, I mean, behind digital preservation. And... Sorry. Switching off my phone. Uh, last but not the least, uh, the third main author, I mean, behind the white paper that we will hear about, Dr. Anthea Josias, uh, is now a lecturer and research investigator at the University of Michigan School of Information. She was, though, uh, at UWC for quite a while as a collections coordinator for the UWC REM Ibu Archives and at, at the Robin Island Museum from, uh, well, 2000 to 2003. Prior to integration of the Mayibuya collection with Robin Island Museum, she was also centrally involved in developing the archives from a student assistant to manager or cover collections. And she's worked as a senior project officer of the Nelson Mandela Foundation Center of Memory and did her PhD in information at the University of Michigan uh, before lecturing in library and information studies at UWC. 
so quite a distinguished set of speakers and uh, I took time I mean to introduce them at first because then we will uh, jump into the presentations and into the following discussion so without uh, uh, any further ado I would like to uh, welcome Patricia and Valmont for their double act and uh, the presentation will introduce the white paper on the archives to the university community, and it will offer an archival vision for UWC that takes account of our historic responsibilities for preservation and ethics and promotes critical engagement with documents from the liberation struggle through access and activation programs. So, Patricia and Valmont, please share your presentation, and I will switch off my video. Please, uh, everybody, I mean, feel free to ask questions and make comments on the chat so that we can pick up on them during the discussion at the end of the session. Thank you so much, Mattia. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, so as the DVC has uh, just said, UWC is the custodian of a number of important archival collections on the campus, most famously the UWC Robben Island Museum Maibuye Archives. And the university, as she related, was recently awarded an infrastructure grant to refurbish the old Senate building with a view to developing a new state-of-the-art archive precinct to hold all of the university collections. Planning for such a physical precinct, however, could not take place outside of a more overarching archival vision for the university, including its potential for shaping our undergraduate and postgraduate students' experiences in the arts, humanities, social sciences, and beyond that. So with this in mind, UWC obtained a planning grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, which came into effect in 2019, to undertake a consultative process towards a white paper. Um, that would help to conceptualize and operationalize a far reaching archival vision for the university that incorporates collections management and development alongside our teaching research and creativity. This webinar therefore presents some of the findings of this archival planning process, which is soon to be officially published in the white paper entitled Revitalizing Research Archives at UWC. Now, I'm just putting up a slide here of our major rec recommendations, which we are gradually going to work our way through um, as we talk today. So I'm not going to stop here, but just throw them up quickly as a hint. Um, and I want to actually start by um, with an important point about appreciating the research relevance of a university archive. And I, I want to set out a very quick schema that shows the interrelated parts and the complexity of the tasks and responsibilities of archivists which makes everything possible for us as researchers. Now, what the university desires, especially the DVC's office, is publications, that is research outputs, like this one, um, you know, a book by Paul Grave. Now, this translates positively into subsidy and reputation for the university. Some of the chapters in a book like this are built upon analysis of the materials held in the UWC Robin Island, Maibuye archive housed on our campus, such as photos collected by the International Defense and Aid Fund in London prior to the transfer of all these collections to UWC in the early 1990s. The values associated with IDAF, the International Defense and Aid Fund, and with UWC at that time, and then with Robin Island Museum, have all shaped the Maibuya collections as an activist archive. And this also defines its collections policy. Now for someone like me to gain the privilege of accessing and then reproducing such images specifically for a publication, a use agreement 
which looks like this, must be signed by all parties. As a member of UWC, by the way, you will see at the bottom, I don't have to pay any copyright fee. This is waived while non-UWC researchers do. So it makes me a privileged part of this archives designated community. For an archive to be in a position to grant such a use agreement, the rights over the material would have had to be agreed at an earlier stage by the producers or the donors and documented. This is all a fundamental part of collections management and such rights management applies as much to new digital, born digital material entering archives as it does to the older analog forms. And uh, the other presenters today will also touch on this. Now, so far I've talked about photos, which is my speciality, but uh, documents that one might consult in an archive such as this for research, you know, like letters, diaries, reports, minutes, they don't necessarily need copyright permission and a use agreement, but they require the agreements made with donors to be very carefully prepared so that they protect the privacy of individuals concerned where matters might be sensitive what we might call private matters in public spaces. And now the Protection of Personal Information Act, the POPI Act requirements also need to be observed. I'm referring to how a research archive works, but an institutional archive such as ours, the Documents, Records and Archives Management Services at UWC, the DRAMS, they also have these responsibilities, which have grown more intricate and with higher stakes in recent years. Now, you might have observed that the photo I showed you earlier that is to be published with a use agreement is obviously not the original photographic print or negative. It is a digital scan of an original. And this is what a researcher is given access to, not the original. Um, uh, and I'm giving you an example of an original negative seen on a light box. So this is very unusual now. So um, the case with many university archives is that they are uh, presenting you with digital scans as they go through processes of digitizing cer certain collections. And here's some examples from Wits University and UCT. And such digitization programs have been an increasing part of collections management in universities, university archives, um, including UWC. This is but what tiny aspect of the question of digitalization on this campus, but it's an important one. It takes us from the universe of the analog to that of the digital, but we cannot leave behind the analog. Now, the white paper on revitalizing UWC archives therefore opens with a section on preservation. Its argument is simple. The better the conditions of preservation for physical items in an archive, whether documents, photos, art, artworks, video, audio cassettes, artifacts, the longer their life will be. And some of these items require storage in special cold rooms, uh, rather like this. So the university needs to get the physical infrastructure for the storage in proper conditions of all these items absolutely right in the proposed new building to house UWC's archives. And these archives are multiple. Besides my Ibuya, there is DRAMS and additional collections in different university departments and centers, including the UWC art collection, plus potential new donations of multimedia collections. So proper preservation gives us something priceless, which is time. And this includes the time to deal with digital challenges. We want to emphasize that while digitalization can help with preservation and that researchers access an interface instead of originals, which helps to maintain them um, in their hopefully ideal conditions, this digital, digitalization is not a substitute for preservation. In fact, preservation and access are symbiotic, constituting the core work of archivists and IT specialists that academics, in my view, urgently need to understand, appreciate, and support. 
Now, uh, coming to some of the challenges that we outline in the white paper that face many of us, and this is not confined to UWC. Um, here's a quick summary of some of the um, uh, difficulties and problems, challenges. So it's very typical in many of the South African archives and institutions which have collections that we visited as part of the planning process uh, to have the following kinds of challenges. And our current situation on campus is no different. Um, so there could be backlogs of collections which are yet to be inventoried, and this might be due to staff shortages, space shortages, or, you know, ambiguous collections policies not yet defined very well. Um, not all collections or donations have proper agreements that are documented, and very typically older donations or co-produced materials like Interviews on audio cassettes sometimes have informal or verbal agreements. Specific collections also might have been digitized at different eras and are stored in different formats, some of which are now obsolete, which is very disconcerting. And these need to be migrated to more up-to-date systems. So, um, you know, some of the solutions that we propose in the white paper have to do with uh, some of these issues. Um, which will be greatly aided by having more space in the new precinct, but there needs to be full archival control and staffing, defined collections policy, and the migration of earlier digital formats into more sustainable systems. And I'm now going to hand over to Valmont to pick up with this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, in the next three slides, I will consider digital infrastructure in three registers. Firstly, as an overview of the ethos that informs this infrastructure and uh, which informs everything that follows from it. Um, so we are still on the slide, ethos plan policy partnerships. Secondly, a brief view of the rational framework, which we call the open archival information system and the opportunities that it affords to the building of this infrastructure. And finally, I will think uh, with about um, the development of infrastructure itself from a preservation point of view. The white paper recognizes UWC's complex leg legacies and its values as an activist community teaching, research, and future-oriented institution of higher education. Flowing from this, a renewed archival ethos opens research and curatorial possibilities for our designated community, which I define as our teaching and research community and our publics. And in the white paper, we also speak about the general public um, defined firstly as the Southern African um, community. Research engagement with archive, artistic practice and critical thinking is an opportunity to align the faculties productively with such a networked future. And in this alignment, there are several possibilities for public curating and for an ongoing inquiry into the intersections of the human and the technological. In other words, they are both organizational and epistemological imperatives um, tied up with this development process. The white paper proposes a research-led curatorial approach which favors humanistic and poetic programming of public um, airings of its collections around these legacies, uh, which as the DVC pointed out, includes the foundational um, gift of the IDAF and Maibuye collections. This we believe is an act of preservation in itself. As a keynote speaker put it at one of our um, digital uh, preservation workshops, quote, will they fight for it when it is threatened? Will they miss it when it is gone? Close quote. And we can think of recent spectacular examples such as the UCT fires, which threatened and nearly destroyed um, quite a bit of, of the holdings there. We can think also of threats to other collecting institutions such as the District Six Museum, 
uh, and the responses of publics which have come in, uh, out in defense of these institutions as critical examples for us at UWC. In other words, community and public ownership of UWC's digital and analog treasures is a critical line of defense and therefore the foundation of efforts at uh, perpetual preservation of its holdings. The white paper establishes trust as a foundational concept asserted in the university's visible long-term commitment to its community. The test is that the content remains sensible to future users without expert intervention. And this is built, as I said, on, the, on these legacies, on policy clarity, on openness and on procedural transparency. It is also built on policy that is alive to this ethos so that the university knows what to collect, what not to collect and how to collect it. Patricia spoke uh, eloquently about the notion of stewardship, uh, which one might call a responsible stewardship, which is critical in accounting for backlogs and for holding institutional memory as part of the work of an archive. The white paper is mindful of the ongoing and increment, incremental nature of this process, emergent um, and research led, and one in which the development of metadata and the enrichment of the information that we already hold is constituted as an ongoing investment in people, in technology, and in the research that it enables. It asserts the importance for preservation of a technology stack that is open that is not restricted or enclosed by proprietary licensing and other agreements, and in which we strongly propose the procurement of a system such as Archive Matica Atom um, based on local server-based cloud infrastructure. It urges the growth of a community of archival practice nationally and globally, which recognizes that while we cannot compete with a large technology stack such as Google and Microsoft and so on, we do need to leverage what we have as institutions of higher learning to support this open community defined cooperation between universities and other players. And in so doing contribute to national and regional um, infrastructure for preservation. Can we go to the next slide please? The OIIS diagram offers such a rational framework an enabling logic for infrastructure, notwithstanding its peculiarities, its strange nomenclatures and so on. Uh, the important point is that it is widely accepted as a preservation standard in South African higher education. Along with the trusted digital repository certification, these models help to establish a baseline from which we can build the trustworthiness that our repository demands. Two caveats are relevant here. First, we, um, it is an understanding that we will be digitizing usable content and that, that, that transaction between the, the act of preservation and the capacity to make the, the content work for the core business of the university. Second, it is important that in setting standards for ourselves, we were reminded at some of these workshops, we must know and believe that we can meet those standards. Um, and that these two systems then are our best bet for addressing this as part of the discipline of archival practice and thinking as we move forward. The big win here is interoperability. We potentially get to make strategic connections with other archives and network collections to take advantage of the benefits of these while securing our own collections. In other words, digit, uh, distributed preservation solutions become possible when our machines and our humans in, inside of our infrastructure can talk to those in other institutions for the benefit of our communities to enable risk management and potentially to enhance access to those uh, collections. If we can go to the third slide now. Infrastructure. Finally, we conceive of digital infrastructure with at least three characteristics. First, Digital infrastructure, as I said, is emergent, built from the bottom up. It enhances existing good practice and also trains the new practice and the skills needed to make it work. And it aligns the technology stack to support this. The model I've uh, flashed before you just now places a designated community at the center of this infrastructure. 
this community's future needs inform present day preservation decisions and risk management. Uh, one thinks of encro encroaching technological obsolescence and planning, which demands rational, documented decisions about when and how to migrate to new technologies. And here, while we think backwards and the importance of um, having inter um, compatibility to previous technologies, it is equally important to think beyond the, the horizon of the existing technological moment, which is cloud. Um, to what happens when cloud becomes obsolete? Do we have a plan? Secondly, in this era of the network archive, access infrastructure will be human as well as machine. Individual researchers, as Patricia showed, may visit the archive to access its contents, but so will other websites, um, APIs, software, algorithms, which places rights-based concerns about ownership, privacy, and, and the ethical implications of access, um, which will take on growing importance for the leadership, for the security, and the management of these collections, and for the principle of physical and intellectual control. We set bits level transparency as the preservation standard. It demands that the archive accounts for every bit use, using tested open tools um, to make sure, for example, that, that the transfers, that, that there is integrity in the transfers and in the transactions that we um, that the, the archive will routinely um, transact. The white paper explicitly cautions against the use, as I've said, of proprietary enclosures, which are sometimes cheaper because of economies of scale, but may be counterproductive in, the, in that long-term perspective when one thinks about obsolescence. And then as a final point, as mentioned earlier, the network archive makes it possible to build distribution, distributed solutions through regional and international partnerships. There are several models for this, such as the famous LOX, um, network, which stands for lots of copies keep stuff safe. Sharing risks by distributing copies, enhancing cooperation between institutions, and by leveraging the scales of these um, networks to train a new cohort of archivists and IT practitioners in the skill sets, in the new skill sets uh, required for the task of building digital preservation infrastructure. Thank you. I can hand back to Patricia now. Thanks, Valmont. Patricia, will you be uh, yeah, um, sharing an answer to the uh, intervention? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Here we go. Hello, I'm Nancy McGovern. Thank you for having me today to talk about some of the preservation and long-term access considerations for digital infrastructure. I'm briefly touching on some issues that might help with the planning for infrastructure that give an idea of how it's very feasible to address preservation needs for collections without very much effort. Um, it's possible to adapt or extend existing infrastructure to support digital collections. Things like the documentation that's needed for sustainable collections supports IT good practice. We do need to go beyond um, normal kinds of description, but all of it can kind of accumulate to make a lot of things more easier to sustain the infrastructure over time. Um, a pretty basic review of security requirements for collections will identify any content specific needs that won't be hard to address in the context of a campus that has other similar needs for confidential data and things like that. It's possible to take steps to extend backups to digital preservation storage for collections. There are a number of options for doing this. Simple backups are not sufficient, but um, coming up with a plan for multiple copies in multiple places is quite doable. The distributed copies for preserving collections may benefit other kinds of content on campus. 
um, confidential data and other kinds of content come to mind, but it's often quite beneficial to have copies of content in multiple places. The kinds of partnerships with IT that are needed to help preserve collections has benefits beyond simply focusing on preserving the collections. There are a lot of kinds of this, this um, getting in the habit of communicating between IT and collections um, can help with all kinds of other um, problem solving initiatives. Planning for collections can help make infrastructure itself sustainable. Let's look at some examples. This diagram shows the digital archives and preservation framework, but as importantly, it also shows the connections between technology and humans, the ways in which the layers of technology that are needed for infrastructure that make up infrastructure support the kinds of activities quite readily that are needed to do um, digital archives, so taking in content and, and processing it, as well as the steps to preserve it over time. You can see sort of the connections with what layers support the activities that are required for collections. There are decisions that need to be made at the top and work their way down. There's things that happen at the bottom that work their way up and require decisions. So it's just a way of showing how this is um, a kind of sits on top of the kinds of infrastructure that you would normally put in place. This table shows the NDSA levels of digital preservation. The thing it does is help organizations in a kind of basic checklist sort of way to address the core areas that are needed to manage digital collections, storage, integrity of the content, control over the content and where it's located, the metadata needed to manage collections over time and the content itself. The stages that you go through are know, so understand this helps with planning projects and helps you get started, protect, make sure that um, any requirements for it are in place and um, updated and applied. Uh, monitor, make sure that any changes over time would be noted and um, adjusted for, and then sustain. These are the steps that make it possible for content to go across time. So this model is a way for going through and seeing what would have to take place to be able to manage collections. This lifecycle workflow model identifies basic stages that digital content goes through from the decision to acquire it through determining what needs to happen for it to be able to be preserved, receiving the content, processing the content, managing the content over time, and making it available. The connection between preservation and access is really essential. Preservation is engaged in to be able to provide long-term access to content. What we need to do for collections has other ramifications for any information that needs to be available longer than say five years. This diagram looks more closely at managed preservation object storage, one of the stages in the workflow we just looked at. You can see the distinction between archival storage, which does require more steps and keeps things for as long as you need them, and temporary storage, which really is a way to make sure that you don't overdo preservation for things that you really aren't intending to keep. It walks through the stages and there's documentation that I've shared with your team so that you can look more deeply at all of the steps for all of the stages that we're looking at. This diagram delves a bit into long-term access. You can see that there, the preserve, preservation object comes over into the access stage and is transformed into packages that would be needed for one or more kinds of access platforms to be able to find and deliver the content to any user now and into the future. That process would happen iteratively as needed as technologies are upgraded. Here we are looking a little bit more closely at the partnerships needed between collections and IT to preserve content over time. For our comprehensive digital preservation services at MIT, we applied the RACI project management approach. The roles for this style of project management include responsible, accountable, supports, consulted, and informed. You can find online lots of information about RACI if you're not familiar with it. Basically though, it allows you to right size the effort needed to do the things involved at different stages of managing the collections over time. This is what our RACI matrix looks like 
for comprehensive digital preservation services at MIT. We've been trying it out, adjusting it as needed, but you can see that there, the, the, um, the kinds of roles involved are digital preservation director, digital archivist, institute archivist, processing team manager. And for IT, the director of the service manager of the infrastructure unit, um, the systems administrators that become involved at different points. We also have central IT listed as well as artifactual, the, provided, the provider for Archivematica, our workflow environment for digital preservation. You can also see the kinds of things that we're looking at, the activities over time, maintenance, training, training for the users as well as the IT back end, periodic review, different kinds of testing as we upgrade parts, monitoring, how do we uh, understand performance, billing even for um, making sure that the providers are um, paid and that that service takes place, administration of the services, all of these things are included in and we'll extend them as needed. This shows the list of content for our support agreement for digital preservation services. It's basically an internal agreement within the libraries for the IT part of libraries to support the services as we go along. A summary of what products and services are included, what maintenance looks like, how things will happen, the kind of documentation needed, future stages. I think that people are not always aware that um, agreements are needed not only externally, but for these kinds of projects internally. You can also see the categories of digital preservation services features that are, are supported, content integrity, cost considerations, flexibility, information security, resilience, scalability, um, support, and transparency. This example might be helpful to the kinds of planning that you're doing right now. I hope that these examples and the issues that we went through are will be helpful to you in your process of developing digital infrastructure. Please do contact me if I can be helpful, clarify anything, provide additional examples, and if there are any questions about the documentation that I provided. Thank you very much. Well, let's thank Nancy virtually, as, uh, as it is often the case these days. And uh, I think Patricia would like to, to say a few final words before we get to the discussion. Am I up? Hold on, just hold on, Anthea. Okay. Hang on. Um, okay, um, just to round off uh, this section, um, our white paper that um, uh, we are presenting here um, present some major recommendations and they fall into five domains. Um, the upgrading of archival processes with increased human resources and skills. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we can go into detail if we want to in the discussion. Um, uh, there's a great deal to, to say here. Um, you know, we... Um, are talking about um, upgrades, um, archival staff appointments with, with certain kinds of expertise across collections and different media. And um, uh, moving on to our second area, um, we really want to promote the interconnected conversation that we've had during the planning process where we've brought together academics, archivists, institutional planners, um, some of our IT colleagues and other key stakeholders. Um, so that we believe a, a steering committee is called for that brings together all these parties um, and our partners um, as we move forward. Um, and that it eventually should take on a permanent status. Um, so this is also something we put as a major recommendation. Um, building digital capacity. Um, we've uh, had a, an excellent um, set of points that Valmont has, has presented now and also some very good advice 
um, and you know ramifications from potential futures that Nancy has shared with us. Um, and hopefully these moves towards enhanced digital infrastructure can be in synergy with the uh, new IOP at UWC. Um, partnerships uh, at, at many levels, including internally, as Nancy has pointed out. Um, many of us have partnerships with other universities. Um, we believe that the archival project will benefit enormously from a range of partnerships that also come with internships for our students um, and exchanges, as well as research collaborations. And finally, the main, a great climax of the white paper is the ways we want to encourage uh, the university community and um, our, our publics, our constituencies to activate these archives. Um, and, and this should feed into academic teaching and curricula, as well as um, research and the public programs that are possible uh, with a very well functioning archive that is integrated into the university. Um, so I'm going to stop there and um, invite Anthea if you want to add any um, additional inputs here. Um, myself, Anthea and Valmont have been the archival planning group, that's what we call ourselves, and we are the authors responsible for putting together this white paper. So Anthea, may I hand over to you? Hey, hi, hello everyone. Thanks, Patricia. Um, and so I, I just like, as somebody who's been involved in working on the white paper process, I'd really just like to reinforce much of what Patricia and Valmont has um, already said, um, and also Nancy, but just a few comments on the white paper process, and then specifically in relation to um, digital archives. So, I mean, I sort of wanted to say that the white paper has really essentially been about ensuring access to archival collections at UWC. Um, and I think as Patricia indicated in her presentation, these archives don't exist anywhere else in the world. Um, and making sure that measures are in place which extend the longevity of these collections so that they can continue to be accessed and used. Um, and so the white paper is about access, but it's also about an underlying preservation infrastructure um, that needs to be continually managed. And I think what we sort of trying to communicate in the white paper is that the two cannot be separated. And when we're talking about preservation, we're not just talking about putting things in storage, but it's also about giving meaning to these collections by capturing the context in which these collections were created and the relationships embedded in these collections. So it's actually about doing the best that we can to ensure that the collections are usable and available in the future. Um, and then also another thing is that when thinking about the archives on campus, we need to think about past, um, present and future. So how were these archives assembled and how did they come to be at UWC? Um, what access protocol should we be following in the present? And then also what policies and workflows do we need to put in place to make sure that these collections are available for many years to come? And then specifically in relation to the digital archive, the open archival information system, which Falmon um, addressed is sort of an appropriate and widely accepted framework to hold all of this together because it lays out what should happen after something is ingested into a digital archive and the processing which needs to happen to prepare archives material for dissemination. And so basically these different kinds of workflows which can be embedded within the OAIS. Um, and then just sort of specifically in relation to digital archives is that um, uh, basically it needs an infrastructure consisting of people, standards, technologies, and resources in much the same way that analog archives do. 
So at a basic level, there needs to be an archival framework that's robust enough to accommodate archival workflows, and these should be clear and well documented. And I think this is what we're trying to communicate um, in the white paper. Um, another point to sort of be mindful of is that many historical archives are in the process of transitioning from print and other analog forms to digital but given the nature of historical archives at this point, it's unrealistic to expect that all analog archives will ever be fully digitized. And so all archival institutions need to make choices about digitization and digital preservation, unless you sort of a wild resource project like the Google digitization project. And so, um, when thinking about digital infrastructure for historical and humanities archives, we really need to make provision for three different scenarios um, at UWC. One would be implementing management access, use and preservation standards for archives that are likely to remain analog over a long period of time. And these collections would most likely be accessible on site only. Um, and then secondly, implementing management access use and preservation standards for archival collections that have already been digitized. And so here it would be important to note that the vast amounts of documents and other items stored as raw files on a local server don't constitute a digital archive, but the work of digital archiving would be a longer much more sustained process that includes deciding what to digitize for um, digitization, implementing standards that support access and preservation, metadata capture, ensuring that metadata is bundled with digital objects that they represent into the future, um, storage concerns, and then ensuring that access copies are available to end users. And so, you know, one of our previous speakers said that digitization is actually the easy part. It's what happens before and after um, digitization that sort of um, counts. And then the third area would be implementing um, protocols and standards for collections that are born digital. And so more and more contemporary archival collections are born digital. Um, there are also analog collections within the Maibue and possibly other collections on campus which contain materials created on older computer formats. And so the work of digital archiving here would be about ingesting these source formats into a digital archive, bearing in mind that these source formats could vary significantly from old computer disks to emails sourced from different email systems to Word files, PDF documents, different kinds of digital audio and video files, and the list um, could go on. And so presently there is some capacity for digital archiving work mainly at the Maibue archives, but this is of course an area that needs to be developed in a focused, strategic and meaningful way. And given the huge nature of the task in an incremental way. And so um, I think I'm going to stop there. I think there's a lot that really could be said, um, sort of getting into to different levels of, of, of the white paper. Um, but yeah, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Antia. <clears throat> and thanks, uh, Patricia and Valmont and Nancy, uh, remotely. Uh, I think uh, well, that's been uh, that's been very interesting, and it got uh, uh, rather technical rather rapidly, which I'm pleased about because I'm a technophile. But uh, um, we are before uh, before we open uh, the floor to questions. There were a couple of questions on the chat that uh, Sarah perhaps is better placed to to relay for me while I manage the Zoom. Yeah, absolutely, Matthias. Um, first of all, we have a question from Samo Dimo, who has asked about um, any national policies on archival preservation. So are there guidelines or policies in terms of archival preservation of uh, records at the, either the university or national level? Um, I'm not aware of any university 
led initiatives from from government but we we are aware of a of a draft policy that has maybe had two iterations uh, that comes from the department of um, sports okay. art and culture um, that document is fairly old i think it's it's already 10 years old um, and thea may know a bit more about it um, but the, we do have that as a reference to to draw on um, yeah and Thea, I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. I think, yeah. well, I had, a, I had a related question. So perhaps, I mean, you can, uh, well, I'll, I'll chip in and then you can answer both. Uh, so I guess uh, uh, the, well, the cloud, uh, well, a cloud deployment uh, of, uh, of an institutional uh, digital archive is, uh, is certainly an option. On the other hand, I mean, cloud technologies uh, uh, allow researchers, institutions, uh, well, whole countries in principle to, to join forces and federate resources to build a shared and more robust uh, uh, digital infrastructure. In this case, a digital archive, for instance, I mean, could, could be seen as a, as a national facility where, I mean, different universities have got access, I mean, to their, uh, to their footprint. Is that uh, a model that, uh, well, UWC or South Africa could use in principle, so a regional or national partnership to, to deploy such digital infrastructure? Uh, I'm aware of similar initiatives in uh, in big data, for instance, which is my uh, area of work. But uh, uh, I wouldn't know whether that's uh, common or being considered in the humanities or in the uh, digital archives uh, domain. Yeah, I just to to kind of say something briefly on Matthias' um, question, I see that um, Gabby is in the audience, if I'm not okay, Gabby Mohali at Fitz, did I see her name? So one of the projects that we've sort of engaged with in this white paper process was the um, National Research Foundation WITS um, Digitization Partnership. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Mattia, in regards to your question, I think that, I mean, what we sort of got away from that was that the aim was to actually set up that kind of um, national hub um, for um, digitized archival collections. Um, and I think it was sort of developed as a training project, which many people at, not many people, a number of people at Maibui have actually participated in. And so those sort of connections um, already exist. And I see do I see Gabby's name somewhere here? Yeah? I'm here, Auntie. Yes, okay, maybe you can <laughs> add. <laughs> um, I was busy typing a question, so I don't really know where you finished off, but um, uh, what was the last question relating to? I'm sorry. Um, there was a Two part question, I guess, from, from different quarters. The one was about national policy. Uh, is there any national policy guideline for, for digitization for this process? And Matteo then asked an additional question about what would be the potential for a kind of consortium based approach to, to shared resources given the cloud, um, that cloud is now the, the kind of standard technology that we are well working with. I think that's kind of where the conversation was going. Very much so. Yes, um, uh, I see. Thanks, colleagues. Um, yeah, we we have a we we had the National uh, Research Foundation initiative. That's correct, and uh, th that informed our collaboration between different um, institutions, mainly tertiary institutions. Um, we we provided training actually to each other, uh, but uh, guided by the, the framework that was laid out in that initiative. Uh, yes, there is something for the, for the, uh, um, for the uh, uh, South African context in terms of digitization policy. Um, it's in the making or it has been kind of concluded, but it is, it is in, in, in our view, um, not guiding enough um, uh, and initially was intended for government institutions only. 
Uh, however, it is uh, it, it, it's short of many aspects that are important for digitization projects in the country um, and for, for collaboration, for allowing collaboration and uh, standard-based working. Um, so if we go into Atom, for example, um, it doesn't provide guidance really uh, for us. We are on our own, um, essentially. And we have been doing that. We have been collaborating with our colleagues at Maibuye as well, who we have established a, a strong, a strong um, digital repository. Um, um, we, we've been running workshops together. Um, another one didn't work out because it was supposed to happen just before lockdown last year. And I was really looking forward to that uh, because my boy is, um, is extremely strong on subject matter. So we, 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 are, we, are, we are closely working together already, I think. And, and, and once this whole um, pandemic um, is, is a little bit more under control, I hope we, we can continue engaging again because it's very important. Um, we have not developed, but we have kind of uh, set up with the help of EBSCO uh, an, a national pilot aggregator. Um, it works It works perfectly. Um, if we work to standards, we involve the, the Mandela Foundation's Atom instance and, and, and the harvesting but very well. So there is a foundation to work on and, and we, we must, we must um, continue doing that, yeah. But I will later have some more questions which I was just typing out, but um, please allow for other questions. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so there was, a, there was another question from the chat, which is possibly more controversial. And uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the question is while uh, well it is very encouraging and exciting that uh, digital preservation is uh, being becoming fully institutionally owned but there are associated commitments that are needed long term so while this planning process was funded from mellon grant as uwc accepted the financial and administrative costs to sustain digital preservation for the long term anybody from the panel um, I don't know if Patricia wants to answer this or shall I have a go? I think have a go, Valmont, because obviously we would urge them to uh, <laughs> take ownership and take full responsibility, but, uh, and, and that is what we encourage. But Valmont, you might have more to say to this. I think just to, to say, I mean, we can't speak on behalf of the university, but we are encouraged by the level of commitment that has already been shown. Uh, there is, a, as, as the DVC pointed out, there's a commitment to provide a bespoke um, facility in a building. Um, and there are all kinds of exciting possibilities with, with that, given the, the, the location of the building and the building's history itself. So there, there are interesting layers of, of, um, of that work. And then um, the, also inside of the institutional operating plan, there's several, um, I think several headlines in that plan that kind of speak to this, uh, the preservation ethos. And we, we like to think as a, uh, I mean, kind of speaking from the team's point of view, that we, we are already ticking quite a few of the boxes there, the, the commitment to digital transformation, the commitment to energizing the research and teaching environment, um, the commitment to improving the experience of our community, of the students, um, so that people can have access to, to the kind of values, the intangible values of the, of the campus itself. And so I think on many levels, there are commitments. So I think what, what the white paper is trying to do is to encourage follow through with those commitments and it always comes down to especially the the, the, the capacity to resource the staffing and the, the kind of um, long-term investment in, in staffing and uh, expertise that is needed. So there are challenges I think that that maybe somebody in the university administration can address but from the team's point of view I think there is a considerable amount for us to to grab hold of so long. Thanks, Valmont. Uh, okay, we have another question on the on the chat. Although I would encourage uh, people to ask them uh, online if they so desire, but I'll I'll go ahead and read it out loud then. So there's a there's a question from Nikiwe about well the identification of what is to be preserved begins when a record is created by determining 
retention periods. Is the white paper taking into consideration the institutional file plan more so with archiving born digital records? So I think that's that's largely a question about uh, whether there is a predefined retention period for the digital archives, if I if I interpret it correctly, but Nikki, we might correct me here if I'm wrong. So assuming, I mean, I... assuming the question is correct or somebody wants to interpret it differently, please, Anthea, go ahead. Okay, I mean, my, my sense is that, you know, in the white paper, we were, we were sort of, we were dealing with historical and humanities archive on campus. But I think the question relates more to sort of um, records management. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it does, the white paper doesn't really cover management of institutional records. Um, we have engaged with the university archives basically about um, archival, sort of the archival collections component of DRAMS, but not really around um, institutional records. Of course. Um, which and, is... uh, well, I think naturally, uh, digital archives of the, of the kind we've been talking about should be forever. And uh, so there's, uh, I think, uh, retention periods do not apply in, uh, yeah. in, in any fashion. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I do not do not see any further questions in the chat. And uh, oh, I think uh, Gabrielle has raised her hand. Uh, would you like to ask a question, Gabrielle? Yes, thanks. If I could pop my two questions. The one relates. Sure. Patricia mentioned that um, uh, uh, there would be preference for um, for copyright um, and, and and access to archival. Collection material. I I don't know how how have you dealt with the issue of open access in the white paper. In in our understanding, in in the archival fraternity, one would always assume, particularly when we're talking about um, national heritage, um, that there would be open access. That that as an archive, we we act as custodians, um, which which would always be reflected in a memorandum of agreement between depositors and and, and the holding archive. Wouldn't you wouldn't you uh, um, advocate for open access rather than rather than ownership um, uh, custodianship versus ownership in other words? And uh, the, the second question very much relates to recent developments around my boy. I would be very interested if you could elaborate a little bit on on how you intend consolidating um, an essentially independent archive such as my boy, a heritage archive with a government entity such as Robin Island. And, and I would like to know what is the future role of, of Robin Island in the context of the new archival precinct, which is a wonderful development and and it would be fantastic if if all your plans are working out. Um, we would be quite envious, actually. <laughs> so, so those are my two questions. Thanks. Thanks. Who would like to take uh, these up? I think Anthea and Belmont are better qualified to answer the first part of that. And I could speak to the second part um, when we come to that. So that would be the, the open access versus uh, ownership or copyright question. Well, not that, yeah. yeah. Anthea, do you want to have a go or shall I? You can both do it. Just go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure that we've, sorry, I'm not sure that we've addressed the question of open access if it's referring to the, um, the um, uh, the discourse of research and, and questions of access to research publications. Um, my sense is that we are thinking about open solutions for preservation technology. So, for example, to make sure, um, as the, I, ge I guess the, the philosophy of the, the company Artifactual uh, puts it, that there is no enclosure 
on the solutions, on the tools that we use to preserve materials. It's a slightly different um, point to thinking about open access publishing for research. I don't, the, um, I, as far as I know, the white paper does not engage with that question. It's, it's engaging more with the kind of concept of, longe of longevity to make sure that there is no propriety enclosure on the tools that we use when we collect and preserve digital content. Um, so that's one part of it. Um, Anthea, I don't know if you want to say anything more about that question. Yeah, so I mean... I, I, sorry, would the, um, if, I, if I may uh, add a little, uh, an extra element to this question. So, so would this mean that uh, whether um, a digital, uh, a digitized version of uh, of an artifact becomes uh, available. I mean, to to the public. I mean, uh, be part of uh, of the curator's decision when he actually looks up uh, uh, at uh, records that might need to be digitized and might need to be provided open access, or whether more uh, uh, within uh, an institutional archive that can be accessed upon demand. Maybe the, the, the other part of a, of a response is to say that the, the archive needs to respect and kind of clarify the arrangements, the agreements that it makes with people who donate material. So that's fairly clear. Of One of the difficulties that Patricia is referring to in her presentation is that often those agreements are not clear. And so a lot of the work, the labor of the archival team will be to have the time and the resources to go and follow up on those agreements and to, to try to firm them up so that we can operate with a measure of certainty. Um, and in that, there is a lot of, um, a lot of that is labor intensive and it needs a lot of support from the, the institution itself. And I think the principle of providing as much access of, as possible is, is a good one but it needs to be balanced with the, the ethical considerations and the, the questions of ownership that arise as a result of that. Uh, very often, they, they are not even questions of ownership. They, they are often questions about ethical matters, about the applicability of new legislation, such as POPIA. Um, those are things that, uh, yeah, the, the archival team is going to have to work through uh, and to kind of equip itself to, to understand and to be able to, to implement judiciously. And often it will be, um, there will be gray areas that we would need to consider. It is a source of great anxiety for any archivist, um, no especially. Yeah. I, uh... Anthea, sorry, would you like to add something? Thank you. So, so as, um mentioned, I mean, a lot of these, some of these collections are actually guided by agreements which were made with donors um, at the time that they were donated to the archive. So there's that. But then there's also like different categories of collections that we need to be thinking about. And so one category of collections would be personal papers. And so with the open access issue, it's a difficult one, um, not just because of agreements, but also because of papaya. And so very often you would have personal collections, which is not just about the person who donated the collection, but there's a number of other people who are mentioned in those collections. And so examples of personal collections would be the personal correspondence of Ahmed Kaprada for that matter. So that would be all of the letters that he wrote to people while on Robben Island. And so when it, and then there's the personal papers of Desmond Tutu, and then there's Kada and Louise Asmal and Albi Sachs. And so that's where it, you know, it kind of um, there's this sort of a sort of a legal framework that needs to be considered. Um, uh, yeah, and so those are all like those are the policy issues that need to be addressed through a some kind of like archival steering committee. Um, another category of works might be orphan works for that matter, um, which would uh, apply not just to sort of video or full material, it could also apply to poster and visual art collections and again the I think while we sort of promoting open access in the white paper, we sort of need to be attuned um, to all of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, 
other collections that can be sort of made available open access without any issues. And so I think establishing what those categories are would be really important. Absolutely. Uh, I guess, well, emphasis in open access is all very well. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't read into the white paper in enough detail, but uh, I would imagine that uh, in terms of impact uh, for the university at large, uh, it, it would be helpful, I mean, to know what kind of material we would envisage, I mean, being able to provide uh, somewhat open access and what kind of material would arguably have to be protected somehow and only be provided upon uh, well ethics approval and upon request uh, to by by the interested research so perhaps uh, yeah, a little extra thought uh, could be could go into that at this stage uh, also to take a census of the kind of archives we, we currently have and we currently consider acquiring uh, i think that would be very helpful uh, so I can see I can see lots of action in the chat, but there was a second part to the question uh, uh, that we just had, and I think Patricia was going to answer about the relationship and the status of the of the Mayibuye archives within uh, the new uh, digital archives that we envisage at UWC. Yes, very briefly, um, and. Um... So, so Gabby, you're asking about, you know, the challenge of um, an institutional archive that we want to consolidate and um, its, its relationship with um, a government entity um, under, the man, under the joint agreement with Robben Island Museum. And just to say that, you know, the, the there has been an ongoing discussion that that was um, reactivated to quite an intense point uh, from 2018, where um, the board of Robben Island Museum, um, uh, we had a number of meetings with our university executive and various representatives. And in 2019, um, various committees were set up to to try to talk through the issues that included the new building um, what programs we might do together um, and and how both sides could actually um, realize more of the potential of the collections um, through working in dialogue and um, you know with the uh, various changes that have gone on at Robben Island Museum. This process of our dialogue has slowed down somewhat, um, but it is a very important issue that we want to re keep revisiting this relationship. Um, and, um, you know, both institutions need to do more to make this, uh, the potential of Maibuye, um more available to the campus and to you know new new publics that are potentially available so i'm i'm not really able to answer your question in a satisfactory way about how you um can resolve the you know um possible institutional differences there but um i i want to add in an extra point which is that um you know, amongst the liberation archives that exist in, in South Africa, for example, and beyond in other parts of Southern Africa, there are very, there are really quite extraordinary challenges. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting, uh, the further you go back to look at the origins of Maibuya collections and IDAF, that they, they did not start off as archives. And so it's been this continual journey and these, um, I would, I could say, moving goalposts. And and so, you know, we wanted to, to commit more to doing justice to what these archives represent and what they can do for us. So I'll just leave it there for now. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. There were uh, there were a couple a couple of comments and a suggestion uh, on the on the chat although i'd rather i'd rather move uh, to the to the next question if that's uh, okay since uh, we we are uh, uh, getting close i mean to the 90 minute uh, time we allotted for this 
So there was a, there is a question about the well archival pristine building and whether that could be elaborated upon and there is a question about the intended timeline. So I think uh, uh, I think we don't well I think I think we may not have one, but uh, perhaps I mean we know uh, how much it could take. I mean in an, in an ideal scenario, I mean would uh, everybody I mean uh, be uh, happy and resourced to to put it in place. I also had a question about whether I mean Mayibuya would be would be having them I mean, in their own separate section or not, but I guess that's part of your previous uh, uh, answer. So that's. Um, if I could just say to that question, Mattia, it, these are all under burning discussion. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very much, um, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, it is probably more proper for somebody from institutional planning to, to answer this and they would be more rigorous about it. But I, I do want to say that the um, pandemic and lockdowns have, of course, slowed down the process um, considerably um, and, and made, you know, bringing the different parts together rather difficult. Um, what we as the archive planning group um, tried to do to, to provide some positive influence, and I think this was a very inspired idea of, of Anthea, which was to invite some of our colleagues in planning and the um, appointed architects firm um, to visit the Eastern Cape and go to the, um, um, the new Amazwe Museum, which is a green museum, which is purpose built as, uh, you know, with archivists and their needs very firmly in mind. Uh, this is for the what was formerly the National Literary Museum of South Africa um, in Grahamstown um, in Makanda. And they have um, managed to retain control over the building process and produced a really marvelous exemplary building, um, which is also a green facility, um, uh, you know, with with government support that enables them to plan for the future because they have ended up with um, fairly ideal and ample conditions for all the parts of the archival uh, the workflow so from ingest through to the processing um, the different kinds of storage um, the the project planning that involves digitization of certain parts, the public programming with exhibitions, the research facilities, the, you know, the auditorium, etc. is really, so, so we've tried to provide some models to think with um, around this process. Um, now, I'm very glad Ben has asked this question, um, because it would be absolutely wonderful if more members of the UWC community could get interested in the question of this precinct and how it should ideally become what how can you know becoming the archive what is that process because it needs inputs you know there's research to be done on the um the mural that exists on the um face uh, that that faces the uh, you know the main entrance to the campus. There's a, a collaborative artwork that's there on the wall. Um, that you know, so and how so how do we retain those traces and those legacies and um, keep them incorporated in the uh, future ar archive precinct? Um, you know, it's it's often a battle with architects who have different imaginaries. And so I'm delighted that uh, there's a question like this. And I, I really urge, you know, we need to think of ways to get involvement in this discussion. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, there was a message of congratulations uh, and, uh, and some thanks messages. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the, the participants, I mean, whether anybody would be interested in asking a question in real time for a change. Uh, I've got plenty, but uh, I'm sure I can ask Patricia offline. <laughs> well, if not, I'm going to give it a go. Uh, there is a, um, 
there are a couple there are a couple of aspects that uh, well speak to my interest in uh, in um, well say inciting research data inciting research artifacts and uh, um, one one is about uh, uh, how the how the digital artifacts or the digital records uh, will be uh, provided uh, to the community in terms of uh, identifiers. Uh, there, is, there is a standard we use uh, a fair bit, which is known as a digital object identifier or DOI, I mean, which works both for publications and for uh, research data. So I wonder if the, if, the, if the OAIS framework, I mean, Envisage is providing digital object identifiers so that uh, digital records can be tracked, cited, referenced, and, uh, well, uh, productivity I mean, of, of an archive can be measured. And then uh, there was another question about the trustworthy digital archive that you would like to establish. Uh, UWC has, uh, has got a, a small research data repository that is uh, that has been growing lately, and uh, we have seen, we have recently applied for uh, the Core Trust Seal accreditation, which is one of the standards in terms of uh, trustworthy digital archives. So I wonder whether this uh, development, I mean, might assist you in any fashion. I don't know enough about your architecture, I mean, to be able to comment on that, but I just thought I would uh, mention it because we are, we put a fair amount of work into uh, the research data repository, which we call Kikapu. And uh, so it would be great if we, if we could see some more traction before or after, I mean, these new digital archive projects are, uh, get going. Anthea, would you like to respond? I mean, I think on the on the question of, of digital object identifiers, I, I think that you know the OAIS framework is basically it's a systems framework, and so there's a lot that can sort of be embedded in there in terms of archival processing. So I don't see any reason why. Um, sort of workflows for assigning DOIs can't be embedded within that framework. So I think it's something to sort of consider for, for different types of collections as well. But I mean, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a big task. I mean, sort of the, the, the trusted digital repository checklist is like, it's quite a long one. And so I think you know, it's going to be really important to sort of establish in consultation with others on campus what the priority should be. And I also think a big part of that should be sort of looking at the overlaps with other um, sort of research platforms, e-research platforms at UWC, because um, I think there are things that, that sort of immediately overlap. We don't have to wait like a long time um, to be able to make those connections. And so, so in terms of OAIS, um, I think a, a part of it sort of is the public interface component or the dissemination component. And so that is the part where we actually need to be having more conversations with people using the archives on campus or sort of making the archives available outside of the university in terms of what that public interface is gonna look like. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question a little bit. <laughs> so. Absolutely. So I would, uh, I would encourage people yeah, to look into Kick Up when it's supporting uh, Figshare for institutions uh, platform, I mean, just to get a feeling, I mean, for what we've been uh, developing, but I mean, surely that uh, doesn't mean, uh, well, that doesn't, that shouldn't restrict, I mean, your options. It's just uh, uh, something to be looking at. And Kikapu, for instance, I mean, does provide, uh, uh, does mint uh, in, uh, in the jargon, digital object identifiers, I mean, for every research uh, product that gets uploaded. So that's, uh, uh, and I see that uh, Gabrielle I mean, mentions that DOIs are standard practice, so I would imagine that we would be adopting them in our archival digitization project as well. And uh, okay, I see some thanks, notes, and some congratulations are in order. 
Right. Uh, okay. So we have uh, formally reached the main our uh, the, the end of our allotted time, which doesn't mean I'm not going to be happy to take another question if needs be. And uh, uh, if uh, if Patricia would like to perhaps I mean uh, uh, bring this uh, to a close. I mean with any final notes. I mean I see that uh, the DVC our host. I mean has had to leave. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's late for everybody, but perhaps Patricia would like to uh, to say a few final words before we wrap it up. Um, well, I just I want to thank everybody who came and um, for all the inputs and the questions and most of all for the interest, because I think that Valmont, Anthea, myself and our um, you know, the committed support that we've had from certain figures in the university executive and institutional planning, but we have felt like, you know, it's been a little bit of a, a process where we've been on our thinking alone. So it's absolutely wonderful at this moment to feel that there is support and there's interest. And just to reiterate, this, this is a moving uh, not a target, this, but this is a moving process and it is taking shape and we invite participation to help shape the future of this, this archive project at UWC. And um, yeah, just to thank you, Mattia, to thank the DVC and um, my fellow panelists, Nancy and Anthea, thank you very much for joining us from Michigan today. Um, uh, that's been it really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yes, my second, uh, my second thanks. I mean, to the panel. I mean, it was very interesting. And uh, I, uh, okay, I see some further messages of thank you, but no further question. So uh, I like, I like to thank uh, the panel again. It was, uh, it was very, uh, very exciting. I mean, to hear what, uh, uh, what we might be looking at. I mean, in the not too distant future and. Uh, I, I encourage people to get in touch with the panel. Uh, with the panel, I mean, uh, and uh, they're easily to they're easily to be found, and perhaps ask for more information about the white paper in, in due time. I'm sure that will become uh, publicly available in some fashion. But I'm sure people can can bug Patricia and others with further questions about it. So thanks everybody. I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to bring this to a close. Uh, please stay tuned I mean, for our uh, future webinars I mean, in, the, in this series. Thanks. thanks. Bye, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mattia. Thank you. Thank you.